About three years ago, I made a video about the Martian helicopter, the one that's just taken its first flight on Mars. Let's see how the comments are going on that, shall we? And, uh, spoiler, there's going to be a lot of crow eaten in this video. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy every second of it. Khaki, who is here just to remind Thunderfoot is wrong? Ingenuity, complete hop, checkmate, JPL1, Mason, zero. NASA pulled it off, and no, these videos are wrong. You should apologize. Yikes, this aged poorly. This video didn't age well. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Joe, ha, huh, it flew. Your busted video is busted. Dom says, usually I agree with your busted videos, but calling this helicopter bullshit two years ago seems to have busted you. Lol, stick to low-hanging fruit busting Kickstarter scammers. There's a reason why real scientists are working for NASA and SpaceX, oh God. Uh, and you're stuck here on YouTube. NASA just proved you wrong and Elon will prove you wrong really soon. Wow, looks like I've got some apologies to make here. I mean, gosh, it would be so humiliating, so embarrassing. If I'd have actually busted this helicopter, then NASA had got it to work in spectacular fashion. I mean, they would have exposed me as this neo-Luddite who just couldn't handle change. Someone whose science clearly isn't to be trusted. I mean, if I'm wrong about the Mars helicopter, then maybe I'm wrong about the uh, Elon Musk stuff too. Yeah, this would be super embarrassing. Good thing it never happened. Oh yeah, someone has done something amazingly embarrassing. Something incredibly humiliating. It's just, it's not me. But for those who wanted an update on the Mars helicopter, let's start with that. Now, it really cannot be overstated just how technologically impressive it is to fly something on another planet. I mean, first of all, you've got to get there, uh, which has difficulties of its own. So take, for instance, Spirit and Opportunity. After six months in space, the first thing that you have to do is hit this incredibly narrow atmospheric window and lose some speed. Then you deploy a parachute and lose the heat shield, descend on a rope, inflate some airbags, fire the retros at exactly the right altitude in a second specific window then bounce around for a bit, deflate the airbags, maybe right the tetrahedron, and then have the rover unpack itself, sufficiently unbumped by all of the knocks that it's had, that it actually rolls off the platform in a functioning form. And I took a look at that and thought, no way, there's just so many things to go wrong. And I think that was in the back of NASA's mind too, which is why they sent two of them. However, no, both worked flawlessly. Then, some years later, came the Curiosity rover, which was a big boy, and used something called Sky Crane to lure itself to the surface via a sort of rocket-suspended platform. Now, these achievements are very impressive because of the technical challenges of packing everything that you need onto a rocket and leaving it there for the best part of a year, and then timed to the second everything has to go right on Mars because none of this can be joysticked, if you like. It's all got to be automated because at best, it takes about four minutes to get a radio signal to Mars and four minutes for the return, so that's about eight minutes. Or at its worst, when Mars is on the other side of the sun, it takes about 40 minutes to get a reply from Mars. So all of this has to be automated. Now, in the latest Perseverance landing, the entire lander was coated with engineering cameras and there was enough bandwidth to send some movie back. So for the first time, we actually got to see what this was like landing on another planet. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance 
safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking. Yeah, this all had to be synchronized up later because, you know, speed of light and all that sort of thing. By the time they actually got the touchdown signal, it had already been on the ground for about 10 minutes. And that's just getting the Mars bear in mind. Now you've got to fly there. About half of the gravity and about one thousandth of the atmospheric pressure of what you would have here on Earth. And to anyone who's actually flown a drone like this, you'll know that just how easy it is to land these things in a non-recoverable position. And what with the current lag time for light getting from Earth to Mars being about 10 minutes and 10 minutes back again, there is no way you could fly this thing by eyeballing it. It has to be flown completely automatically on its own software. Now, I did a video about this some years ago. Maybe now is a good time to revisit that and take a look what I actually said. For this helicopter, I reckon they've got coin flipping chances of being able to solve the power issue within the weight requirements. Another coin flipping chance that it will never make it to Mars in a flyable condition. And even if it gets there, I reckon you've got coin flipping type chances that it won't last longer than a week. Risky as hell, which is also pretty much NASA's assessment. It's high risk, high reward stuff, but it all checks out. There's nothing clearly stupid here. So yeah, from immediate skepticism about this NASA helicopter, after running the numbers, it more or less checks out. Now I reckon I'm gonna need a bigger solar panel, yeah, probably about three times this size, because honestly I just can't see them running all of this on an effective continuous power supply of less than one watt. Okay, so I more or less agree with NASA's assessment. Uh, except maybe I say it needs a bigger solar panel or something. And yeah, wow, it looks like they put a bigger solar panel on it. And what else did I say? I said they should probably angle that solar panel so it's the vibrations of the flight would shake the dust off. Gotta admit, I would also replace that solar panel from a plate to a mild cone. Because a plate, the dust will just accumulate on it and the solar panel will lose efficiency. If, however, it's a gentle cone, sure, you'll lose some efficiency on the solar panel, but on the upside, every time the drone flies, the dust will shake off the cone. Meh, yeah, just a thought. Which looks like it might have been a pretty sensible idea at this point. But it's conceivable that they had worries about, you know, this affecting the aerodynamics or something. I, I doubt it. A shed roof type design for the solar panels probably wouldn't have had any effect on the aerodynamics and wouldn't have taken up any more space. One thing this drone absolutely won't be doing is doing any interesting flying whatsoever. It's going to be straight up, across and down again. Nothing fancy, nothing risky. So it seems like I was actually pretty much on the money with this one. You know, saying that it was difficult but possible, which was kind of basically just agreeing with NASA's assessment. The helicopter flew today. If you tried to outright bust this helicopter instead of just being sceptical, you'd be the biggest clown right now. Dodged a bullet there. Uh, oh, sorry, what? I, I looked at the evidence and concluded that it was entirely possible. You know, just like I looked at the evidence for solar roadways, hoverboards, and thorium-powered cars. I looked at the evidence and concluded those were all dumb ideas, and I looked at the Mars helicopter and concluded it wasn't. There was no bullet dodging involved here. There was just science. Now, this was an isolated comment. Meh, I'd have let it go. However, the comment section is littered with stuff like this. Huh. If only there was some way of working out where they're all coming from. What, what, what was that two comments up? NASA just proved you wrong, and Elon will prove you wrong really soon. Ah, it's the Musk fans. Probably bought on by the fact that after I show that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the Mars helicopter, then go on to take a look at Elon Musk's presentation for Starship, where Elon Musk actually says multiple things that are fundamentally stupid at a high school level. This is what bugs me. I, I took a look at this helicopter project with all sorts of skepticism, but it more or less all checks out. It's not fundamentally stupid. P 
Picturing your spacecraft out at Saturn using solar panels is just fundamentally stupid. It doesn't even pass high school levels of inspection. You know, if these solar panels generate some 200 kilowatts when they're by the Earth, that means that by the time they get out to Saturn, they're generating about 2 kilowatts of power, meaning that you have to sustain everyone on that spaceship with less than the power it takes to run a kettle. But it gets worse than that, because at the end of his presentation, he shows people getting off his magnificent spaceship onto Europa. The uh, problem with that is, Europa is right in the middle of Jupiter's screamingly radioactive Van Allen belts. Within hours, everyone there would experience radiation sickness, and within about 12 hours, they would have all been fatally exposed to radiation. And you just look like kind of a melon who doesn't really know what they're talking about when you then go on to explain how radiation in space isn't that big of a deal in Mars or elsewhere. Uh, sure. I, I mean, the, the, my view on the radiation thing is that there, there's certainly some risk of radiation, um, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not deadly. Um, there will be some slight increased risk of, uh, of, of cancer, uh, but it's, it's, I think, relatively minor. When you're sat in front of a picture where everyone traveling on your solar system exploring rocket has just been exposed to a fatal dose of radiation. So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. Fred Fredbug, lol, stick to low-hanging fruit busting Kickstarter scammers. There's a reason why real scientists are working for NASA and SpaceX, oh God. Uh, and you're stuck here on YouTube. I mean, the sheer level of cringe in some of these comments. Local man tries to disprove government-funded scientific organization. Yeah, sure. Local man would have no chance of debunking government-funded research. Well, a major announcement today by NASA that a new form of life has been discovered, but for days the media has been anticipating it and discussing it. Ah, uh, there's a life form. If you're getting your news from me, I want to make sure I cover this. There's a life form based on Arsenic. But that also this could be about how NASA has a new way of trying to find extraterrestrial life. Well, a mysterious NASA press release sparking major attention. They're holding a press conference this time tomorrow afternoon to announce, quote, an astrobiological finding that will impact the search for evidence of extraterrestrial life. All right, Tom, let me start with you. They're touting this. They're the ones who use the terms extraterrestrial life. What do we expect? Yeah, a local man called that one's bullshit straight away. And months later, yeah, it turned out it was all kind of bullshit. And it happened again about a decade or so later. Not with NASA this time, but with people like MIT this time, hyping the phosphine as a biosignature for life on Venus. Scientists might have just discovered signs of life on Venus. It feels game-changing. It is so unexpected, but I never thought in my life that it would be something we should either look for or that we would find in Venus. Incredible news has just been announced by a team of astronomers, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in decades. Possible evidence for life has been announced on another planet, Venus. There's this Goldilocks zone in the atmosphere that is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And that's exactly where we found phosphine. My original work had said, if you find phosphine on any terrestrial planet, it can only mean life. And that wasn't an outrageous claim until recently. Which, yeah, again, I was the voice in the wilderness explaining why that was all bullshit. And spoiler, a few months later, it emerged that it was all bullshit. Hey, this local man seems to do okay. I wonder how he would do against one of the world's top universities. Uh, let's say, for instance... Berkeley, if they were promoting something that was obviously bullshit. And so we have students that are um, both working with the Satarja Center as well as the Jacobs Institute for Design. We're testing the boundaries of what you can actually achieve and in a practical sense of being able to take water out of this, um, uh, this type of atmosphere. Now you may think, what, seriously? University of California, Berkeley, is in on this. Yep. And this is where it gets kind of depressing. This guy is their chief scientist. 
and founding director, and he hasn't even looked at the simple thermodynamics. Seriously, here is the uh, interim faculty director of another Berkeley Institute, the Jacobs Institute, worrying about the design of a machine that you can trivially show is a non-starter thermodynamically. Half in the Jacobs Institute have been really hands-on involved. And for those who don't know the glorious end of that story, Waters here, shortly before banishing off the face of the internet, started selling uh, dehumidifiers, off-the-shelf Walmart dehumidifiers for a thousand bucks, when you could buy the exact same dehumidifier from Walmart for a couple of hundred bucks. And, and for those Musk fans who are struggling with this, I don't claim that everything that NASA does is bullshit, but when NASA does something that's bullshit, I call it as bullshit. And when NASA does something that's clearly not bullshit, I say, I took a look at this helicopter project with all sorts of skepticism, but it more or less all checks out. Meanwhile, I do exactly the same thing with Elon Musk, which seems to cause great wheeling and gnashing of teeth, mostly because almost everything that Elon Musk does is bullshit. Yeah, the Hyperloop was an ancient idea that was dead on arrival. The loop is just a taxi service in a tiny tunnel with rave lights. Transporting passengers 40 feet underground at about 30 miles per hour. Sorry, a really slow taxi service running in a tiny tunnel with rave lights. Yeah, there's an old saying. It's easier to con people than to convince them that they've been conned. And this is probably nowhere more vividly seen than the Elon Musk fan base, where, okay, cool, let's go to the Elon Musk fan base to see why promising this and delivering this. No, th 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 this was all perfectly intentional. This was part of Elon Musk's brilliant fifth dimensional chess stratagem to reveal the pathetic, slow moving taxis going through tiny tunnels because you may have heard about this Vegas loop before, but you may not have thought about how this is actually the master Trojan horse plan, and we know that Elon Musk is the master of Trojan horsing. But this is more like a highway underground, and because it's Las Vegas, this is also a thrill ride. This right here, folks, is again Elon Musk being the perfect Trojan horser. This guy should change his name from Techno, Techno King to Trojan Horser, like Master Trojan Horser, because golly, oh folks, it is going to be huge for Tesla. Oh gosh, people ask me why is 50% of my portfolio in Tesla? I just ask myself, why isn't 80% of my portfolio in Tesla? <laughs> folks, whoa, whoa. This is a game changer. This is how they're going to trick the regulators to be okay with self-driving cars on all roadways in the future. This is the future, folks. But right now, these cars are not autonomous yet. However, they will be. Uh, yeah, sure they will. However, for those of us who occasionally like to dip our toes in reality, you'll recall that this was originally meant to be self-driving minibuses. But those were scrapped very early on. You know, too difficult, too expensive, all that sort of thing. And Elon Musk at the time, <laughs> in an attempt to see just how gullible his fans actually were, put out the tweet to see if they could accept that if it was just cars driving through tunnels, that this would actually be really profound. And boy, was he not disappointed. Now they just don't fantasize about how this is gonna make Elon Musk billions, but trillions. What if I told you that Elon Musk could make trillions of dollars by boring one set of tunnels connecting North America to Asia and do it cheap and make life better for everyone in the world? All he has to do is take the uh, tunnel project that took him about two years to complete one mile and extend it another uh, 6,000 miles and run a hyperloop in it. Yeah, that sounds sensible. You could ride by train from San Francisco to Beijing in a day and a half. A day and a half? Elon's gonna do that in a supersonic hyperloop in like six hours. Yes, and Elon Musk is going to prove me wrong really soon. And I need to apologize for the uh, Martian helicopter video, which, eh, if you're being honest, has actually stood the test of time pretty well.
Anyway, so that's today's video. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I don't want to stay on the Elon Musk thing, but with comments like this, what can you do? Anyway, if you enjoyed that, drop a thumbs up on it. If you really enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you really like the work of this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching.